Welcome to the BookCast YouTube channel. Today, the audiobook of Fyodor Dostoevsky's A Christmas Tree, A Wedding is with you. You can subscribe to our channel to listen to more audiobooks and like our video to support us. Let's start our audiobook without making you wait too long. The other day I saw a wedding, but no, I had better tell you about the Christmas tree. The wedding was nice, I liked it very much, but the other incident was better. I don't know how it was that, looking at that wedding, I thought of that Christmas tree. This was what happened. Just five years ago, on New Year's Eve, I was invited to a children's party. The giver of the party was a well-known and business-like personage, with connections, with a large circle of acquaintances, and a good many schemes on hand, so that it may be supposed that this party was an excuse for getting the parents together and discussing various interesting matters in an innocent, casual way. I was an outsider, I had no interesting matter to contribute, and so I spent the evening rather independently. There was another gentleman present who was, I fancied, of no special rank or family, and who, like me, had simply turned up at this family festivity. He was the first to catch my eye. He was a tall, lanky man, very grave and very correctly dressed. But one could see that he was in no mood for merrymaking and family festivity, whenever he withdrew into a corner he left off smiling and knitted his bushy black brows. He had not a single acquaintance in the party except his host. One could see that he was fearfully bored, but that he was valiantly keeping up the part of a man perfectly happy and enjoying himself. I learned afterwards that this was a gentleman from the provinces, who had a critical and perplexing piece of business in Petersburg, who had brought a letter of introduction to our host, for whom our host was, by no means Conamore, using his interest, and whom he had invited, out of civility, to his children's party. He did not play cards, cigars were not offered him, everyone avoided entering into conversation with him, most likely recognizing the bird from its feathers, and so my gentleman was forced to sit the whole evening stroking his whiskers simply to have something to do with his hands. His whiskers were certainly very fine. But he stroked them so zealously that, looking at him, one might have supposed that the whiskers were created first and the gentleman only attached to them in order to stroke them. In addition to this individual who assisted in this way at our host's family festivity, he had five fat, well-fed boys, I was attracted, to by another gentleman. But he was quite of a different sort. He was a personage. He was called Yulian Mastakovich. From the first glance one could see that he was an honored guest, and stood in the same relation to our host as our host stood in relation to the gentleman who was stroking his whiskers. Our host and hostess said no end of polite things to him, waited on him hand and foot, pressed him to drink, flattered him, brought their visitors up to be introduced to him, but did not take him to be introduced to anyone else. I noticed that tears glistened in our host's eyes when he remarked about the party that he had rarely spent an evening so agreeably. I felt as it were frightened in the presence of such a personage, and so, after admiring the children, I went away into a little parlor, which was quite empty, and sat down in an arbor of flowers which filled up almost half the room. The children were all incredibly sweet, and resolutely refused to model themselves on the grown-ups, regardless of all the admonitions of their governesses and mamas. They stripped the Christmas tree to the last sweetmeat in the twinkling of an eye, and had succeeded in breaking half the playthings before they knew what was destined for. Which particularly charming was a black-eyed, curly-headed boy, who kept trying to shoot me with his wooden gun. But my attention was still more attracted by his sister, a girl of eleven, quiet, dreamy, pale, with big, prominent, dreamy eyes, exquisite as a little cupid. The children hurt her feelings in some way, and so she came away from them to the same empty parlor in which I was sitting, and played with her doll in the corner. The visitors respectfully pointed out her father, a wealthy contractor, and someone whispered that 300,000 rubles were already set aside for her dowry. I turned round to glance at the group who were interested in such a circumstance, and my eye fell on Yulian Mastakovich, who, with his hands behind his back and his head on one side, was listening with the greatest attention to these gentlemen's idle gossip. Afterwards I could not help admiring the discrimination of the host and hostess in the distribution of the children's presents. The little girl, who had already a portion of 300,000 rubles, received the costliest doll. Then followed presents diminishing in value in accordance with the rank of the parents of these happy children, 
Finally, the child of lowest degree, a thin, freckled, red-haired little boy of ten, got nothing but a book of stories about the marvels of nature and tears of devotion, etc., without pictures or even woodcuts. He was the son of a poor widow, the governess of the children of the house, an oppressed and scared little boy. He was dressed in a short jacket of inferior nankeen. After receiving his book he walked round the other toys for a long time, he longed to play with the other children, but did not dare, it was evident that he already felt and understood his position. I love watching children. Their first independent approaches to life are extremely interesting. I noticed that the red-haired boy was so fascinated by the costly toys of the other children, especially by a theater in which he certainly longed to take some part, that he made up his mind to sacrifice his dignity. He smiled and began playing with the other children, he gave away his apple to a fat-faced little boy who had a mass of goodies tied up in a pocket handkerchief already, and even brought himself to carry another boy on his back, simply not to be turned away from the theater, but an insolent youth gave him a heavy thump a minute later. The child did not dare to cry. Then the governess, his mother, made her appearance, and told him not to interfere with the other children's playing. The boy went away to the same room in which was the little girl. She let him join her, and the two set to work very eagerly dressing the expensive doll. I had been sitting more than half an hour in the ivy arbor, listening to the little prattle of the red-haired boy and the beauty with the dowry of three hundred thousand, who was nursing her doll, when Yulian Mastikovich suddenly walked into the room. He had taken advantage of the general commotion following a quarrel among the children to step out of the drawing room. I had noticed him a moment before talking very cordially to the future heiress's papa whose acquaintance he had just made, of the superiority of one branch of the service over another. Now he stood in hesitation and seemed to be reckoning something on his fingers. Three hundred, three hundred, he was whispering. Eleven, twelve, thirteen, and so on. Sixteen, five years. Supposing it is at four percent, five times twelve is sixty, yes, to that sixty, well, in five years we may assume it will be four hundred. Yes. But he won't stick to 4%, the rascal. He can get 8 or 10. Well, 500, let us say, 500 at least, that's certain, well, say a little more for frills. Hum. His hesitation was at an end, he blew his nose and was on the point of going out of the room when he suddenly glanced at the little girl and stopped short. He did not see me behind the pots of greenery. It seemed to me that he was greatly excited. Either his calculations had affected his imagination or something else, for he rubbed his hands and could hardly stand still. This excitement reached its utmost limit when he stopped and bent another resolute glance at the future heiress. He was about to move forward, but first looked round, then moving on tiptoe, as though he felt guilty, he advanced towards the children. He approached with a little smile, bent down and kissed her on the head. The child, not expecting this attack, uttered a cry of alarm. What are you doing here, sweet child, he asked in a whisper, looking round and patting the girl's cheek. We are playing. Ah. With him? Yulian Mastikovich looked askance at the boy. You had better go into the drawing room, my dear, he said to him. The boy looked at him open-eyed and did not utter a word. Yulian Mastikovich looked round him again, and again bent down to the little girl. And what is this you've got, a dolly, dear child, he asked. Yes, a dolly, answered the child, frowning, and a little shy. A dolly, and do you know, dear child, what your dolly is made of? I don't know, the child answered in a whisper, hanging her head. It's made of rags, darling. You had better go into the drawing room to your playmates, boy, said Yulian Mastikovich, looking sternly at the boy. The boy and girl frowned and clutched at each other. They did not want to be separated. And do you know why they gave you that doll? asked Yulian Mastikovich, dropping his voice to a softer and softer tone. I don't know. Because you have been a sweet and well-behaved child all the week. At this point Yulian Mastikovich, more excited than ever, speaking in most dulcet tones, asked at last, in a hardly audible voice choked with emotion and impatience. And will you love me, dear little girl, when I come and see your papa and mama? 
Saying this, Yulian Mastakovich tried once more to kiss the dear little girl, but the red-haired boy, seeing that the little girl was on the point of tears, clutched her hand and began whimpering from sympathy for her. Yulian Mastakovich was angry in earnest. Go away, go away from here, go away, he said to the boy. Go into the drawing room. Go in there to your playmates. No, he needn't, he needn't. You go away, said the little girl. Leave him alone, leave him alone, she said, almost crying. Someone made a sound at the door. Yulian Mastakovich instantly raised his majestic person and took alarm. But the red-haired boy was even more alarmed than Yulian Mastakovich. He abandoned the little girl and, slinking along by the wall, stole out of the parlor into the dining room. To avoid arousing suspicion, Yulian Mastakovich, too, went into the dining room. He was as red as a lobster and, glancing into the looking glass, seemed to be ashamed at himself. He was perhaps vexed with himself for his impetuosity and hastiness. Possibly, he was at first so much impressed by his calculations, so inspired and fascinated by them, that in spite of his seriousness and dignity he made up his mind to behave like a boy, and directly approach the object of his attentions, even though she could not be really the object of his attentions for another five years at least. I followed the estimable gentleman into the dining room and there beheld a strange spectacle. Yulian Mastakovich, flushed with vexation and anger, was frightening the red-haired boy, who, retreating from him, did not know where to run in his terror. Go away, what are you doing here? Go away, you scamp, are you after the fruit here, eh? Get along, you naughty boy. Get along, you sniveller, to your playmates. The panic-stricken boy in his desperation tried creeping under the table. Then his persecutor, in a fury, took out his large batiste handkerchief and began flicking it under the table at the child, who kept perfectly quiet. It must be observed that Yulian Mastakovich was a little inclined to be fat. He was a sleek, red-faced, solidly built man, paunchy, with thick legs, what is called a fine figure of a man, round as a nut. He was perspiring, breathless, and fearfully flushed. At last he was almost rigid, so great was his indignation and perhaps, who knows, his jealousy. I burst into loud laughter. Yulian Mastakovich turned round and, in spite of all his consequence, was overcome with confusion. At that moment, from the opposite door our host came in. The boy crept out from under the table and wiped his elbows and his knees. Yulian Mastakovich hastened to put to his nose the handkerchief, which he was holding in his hand, by one end. Our host looked at the three of us in some perplexity, but as a man who knew something of life, and looked at it from a serious point of view, he at once availed himself of the chance of catching his visitor by himself. Here, this is the boy, he said, pointing to the red-haired boy, for whom I had the honor to solicit your influence. Ah, said Yulian Mastakovich, who had hardly quite recovered himself. The son of my children's governess, said our host, in a tone of a petitioner, a poor woman, the widow of an honest civil servant, and therefore, and therefore, Yulian Mastakovich, if it were possible. Oh, no, no. Yulian Mastakovich made haste to answer, no, excuse me, Philip Alexievich, it's quite impossible. I've made inquiries, there's no vacancy, and if there were, there are twenty applicants who have far more claim than he. I am very sorry, very sorry. What a pity, said our host. He is a quiet, well-behaved boy. A great rascal, as I notice, answered Yulian Mastakovich, with a nervous twist of his lip. Get along, boy, why are you standing there? Go to your playmates, he said, addressing the child. At that point, he could not contain himself, and glanced at me out of one eye. I, too, could not contain myself, and laughed straight in his face. Yulian Mastakovich turned away at once, and in a voice calculated to reach my ear, asked who was that strange young man? They whispered together and walked out of the room. I saw Yulian Mastakovich afterwards shaking his head incredulously as our host talked to him. After laughing to my heart's content I returned to the drawing room. There the great man, surrounded by fathers and mothers of families, including the host and hostess, was saying something very warmly to a lady to whom he had just been introduced. 
the lady was holding by the hand the little girl with whom Yulian Mastakovich had had the scene in the parlor a little while well before. Now he was launching into praises and raptures over the beauty, the talents, the grace and the charming manners of the charming child. He was unmistakably making up to the mama. The mother listened to him almost with tears of delight. The father's lips were smiling. Our host was delighted at the general satisfaction. All the guests, in fact, were sympathetically gratified, even the children's games were checked that they might not hinder the conversation, the whole atmosphere was saturated with reverence. I heard afterwards the mama of the interesting child, deeply touched, beg Yulian Mastakovich, in carefully chosen phrases, to do her the special honor of bestowing upon them the precious gift of his acquaintance, and heard with what unaffected delight Yulian Mastakovich accepted the invitation, and how afterwards the guests, dispersing in different directions, moving away with the greatest propriety, poured out to one another the most touchingly flattering comments upon the contractor, his wife, his little girl, and, above all, upon Yulian Mastakovich. Is that gentleman married? I asked, almost aloud, of one of my acquaintances, who was standing nearest to Yulian Mastakovich. Yulian Mastakovich flung a searching and vindictive glance at me. No, answered my acquaintance, chagrined to the bottom of his heart by the awkwardness of which I had intentionally been guilty. I passed lately by a certain church, I was struck by the crowd of people in carriages. I heard people talking of the wedding. It was a cloudy day, it was beginning to sleet. I made my way through the crowd at the door and saw the bridegroom. He was a sleek, well-fed, round, paunchy man, very gorgeously dressed up. He was running fussily about, giving orders. At last the news passed through the crowd that the bride was coming. I squeezed my way through the crowd and saw a marvelous beauty, who could scarcely have reached her first season. But the beauty was pale and melancholy. She looked preoccupied, I even fancied that her eyes were red with recent weeping. The classic severity of every feature of her face gave a certain dignity and seriousness to her beauty. But through that sternness and dignity, through that melancholy, could be seen the look of childish innocence, something indescribably naive, fluid, youthful, which seemed mutely begging for mercy. People were saying that she was only just sixteen. Glancing attentively at the bridegroom, I suddenly recognized him as Yulian Mastakovich, whom I had not seen for five years. I looked at her. My God! I began to squeeze my way as quickly as I could out of the church. I heard people saying in the crowd that the bride was an heiress, that she had a dowry of five hundred thousand and a trousseau worth ever so much. It was a good stroke of business, though. I thought as I made my way into the street. The End